there is a statement she makes in 1891. She writes this about the Ten Commandments. She says, the Ten Commandments are ten laws, and there is not a negative in any of them. Now, anybody who's read the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, 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 right? So it, it appears to be negative. Well, scholars have discovered something. Recently, I'm talking about recently, they have discovered in the original language, she has no knowledge of biblical languages, that, that Ten Commandments can be rendered two ways. Thou shalt not, or you will not. Now, if you start the Ten Commandments, this is a little, little, maybe a little too deep, but if you start the Ten Commandments at, thou shalt have no other gods before me, then it's a thou shalt not kind of faith, right? But it doesn't start there. It begins when God says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I'm the one that delivered you, Israel, out of Egyptian bondage. And then the commandments begin. And what God is saying is, because I brought you out, I promise you, that if you stay with me and if I am a part of your life, not only will you not, you will not have any other gods of, uh, before me. You will not steal and you will not lie because I will be in you. That's, that's a fascinating recalibration of the Ten Commandments, whereas, you know, we're told, hey, these are just ten commands. What you're saying is, look, these are ten outcomes, ten promises. Promises. That is the result of believing God's deliverance in your and life. And she couldn't know it because no biblical person of that time knew that understanding. Had, she had no knowledge of biblical languages. She is writing what God had revealed to her. And, and, and scholars today, one scholar, Dr. Richard Davidson at Andrews University, has proven that and many other things like that, where she could not have understand what we know today. That is tremendous. The Bible does say that people in the end of time, there'd be visions and prophecies, but there are a lot of false prophets you know, Absolutely. out there. Uh, how would you say that uh, pass some of the, the test of a, of a biblical test of a genuine prophet? Because a lot of people say all sorts of things. Today. Well, yeah, there, there's, there, there, there are four different tests. One of them is fruit. It's called the fruit test. By their fruits, you will know them. How, how the person lives, lives their life, right? Um, well, I wouldn't take Adventist word for it. Take the word of secular entities that wrote about her after her life, after she passed away. One of those is a couple of newspapers in New York and some other places that said she was honest, she was worthy of a prophetess, she gave away her resources to start different institutions around the world, she lived the life. That's one. Then, you know, does the person speak uh, according to what the Bible calls the law and the testimony, according to God's word? The prophets, what they have written, what God has given in scripture, uh, does, does the prophet's message line up? Well, not only does her, her, her messages line up, but she is deeply biblical, over 30,000 biblical references in her writings. Now, that's really fascinating because a false prophet if we're using that term the way we are, a false prophet would be putting themselves over scripture because scripture would be shooting themselves, <laughs> shooting them in the foot if they, exactly. but you're saying, look, no. she said, look, the scripture is what it's all about. She constantly pointing people back to the that, scripture. In fact, she is, she's often called a messenger to scripture, a prophetess to scripture because her goal, her, her, she believes that, that God has spoken to her in order to push people back to his standard and his standard and his character is found in his word. And she said, I would not have, been ne I would not have needed to share the testimonies God has given me if you had simply obeyed what God has given in his word. So that her, she understands her perspective. In fact, she, she writes very, very clearly, I present to you, I recommend to you, the word of God as our only rule of faith and practice. That's who she is. So you mentioned three principles. You said the fruit test. Yes. The fruits of the spirit got to be there, yeah. right? I mean, it, yeah. Fruit. The fruit test and then, uh, you know, the... It, correct the, me from the exaltation of God's of word. Scripture, yes. What was the third test? Another test is, does the person, does, does this, this, this person who claims to be a prophetess, does what they say come true? Does what they right? say come true? And okay, that's been, that was a hundred years ago. Did if, we, if that, has that been verified? Well, I'll, let, me, let me give you one example. There's, there was a, a huge earthquake in San Francisco in 1906. That earthquake was considered one of the major tragedies in, in U.S. history. She wrote about that earthquake before it happened. So a few days before that earthquake actually happened, she begins to tell people, I, I think something is going to happen in this city. 
I think God is going to judge this city for its behavior and what, is, what it's been doing and, and how people have been acting. And she says, I saw, this is, this is her, I saw buildings fall. I saw people running. I saw fires in the streets. This is before the actual event. And then two days later, that event happens. Incredible. Incredible. I mean, you know, uh, when you're thinking about Ellen White and everything you've shared, what is her legacy that she has left to this world? Well, the legacy is large. Number one, a church of over 22, 20, 23 million people. That's big. The second largest education system in all of the world, parochial system is in the Adventist church, uh, a health system that is second to none in the world. These are all her legacies, publishing uh, in many, many different areas. But I'll tell you one that, that is probably near and dear to my heart. It's a legacy of, ju a legacy of justice. Yeah. Interesting. This lady was anti racist before anti-racist was cool. <laughs> <laughs> she was anti-slavery before that was cool. And our pioneers were abolitionists. So she writes, for instance, I, I, I'll tell a quick story, Anil. 1858, 1859, um, John Brown, John Brown, John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. John Brown is trying to raise a revolution to, to, to stop slavery, and he tries to capture the Confederate uh, depot that's got all of these arms, raise a revolution to stop slavery. A man of conscience, right? John Brown gets captured. He ends up being killed. His, his own children are, are in the revolution with him, and, 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 and they, are, they are also put to death. Bad situation, but a man of conscience. That story was published around 1859 or so of John Brown's raid and how it failed. And one of our leaders was, was talking about that with another person and laughing about making light of John Brown's sacrifice in the presence of Ellen White. She said to them, I'm paraphrasing her, what John Brown did was the right act. She says in effect, you laugh at him at your peril. But the, 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 the concern that motivated him, if others were as concerned, we would change the trajectory of this nation. She says something to that effect. And then she says to them, then she says to them, this same issue of slavery will divide this nation and cause it to go into great turmoil. Incredible. Two years later, the Civil War begins. Yeah. That is incredible. She was, in fact, I'll tell this last story. She writes a, a little tract called Our Duty to the Colored People. She felt that the church was not doing enough for those who had come out of slavery, that the church should be more active helping them. Now, just what you're telling me, right off the bat, that must have been so countercultural. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane. I mean, she's, she is literally challenging at a time when it, it, is, it is dangerous to do so. In fact, she has a son, Edson White, who is wayward, you know, like me getting into trouble. <laughs> but that little boy reads his mother's tract, Our Duty to the Colored People, and decides this is his work. Mm -hmm. This is the work to which God has called him. He creates, he builds a large boat called the Morning Star, goes down the Mississippi River, helping ex-slaves come to know God, teaching them how to read, uh, takes his life in his hands many times. He writes to his mother. She's in Australia, writes to her mom, I don't know how we're going to do this work. She says, son, stay at this work. This is God's work. That's the woman I you know, what you're describing are, are really powerful biblical principles that are being played out. Absolutely. You ever heard of something called the, the, the Slavery Bible? Now, th what's really interesting about this is actually in a museum still to this day. This is a book that slave owners gave to slaves, but they had to take out half of the New Testament, most of the Old Testament, including the book of Exodus, because they know that the people who are reading this book, it was liberating them. <laughs> And I, I just think that's a testament Anil, to the power of freedom. You are completely correct. In fact, she writes, she says, those of us today who are anticipating the coming of Jesus ought to look at the plight of American slaves and look at the Exodus story. She writes about those two things in tandem as powerful things. In fact, the, 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 the chapter of the Bible, the chapter of the Bible it is believed on which she has written the most is not in Revelation, it's not in Matthew, it's not in Mark. It's Isaiah 58, the justice chapter of the Bible. Incredible. Dwayne, this has been fantastic. Kevin, this has been amazing. Just a conversation. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm about to jump off the chair and I'm tired. <laughs> this is why we like to tell true stories. <laughs> stories. You, you can't write this stuff. Amen.